Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Department of Electrical Engineering, my name is Professor Alice Parker, and I'd like to invite you to our distinguished lecture for today. And the speaker is Dr. Kwabena Bohan from Stanford. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to host Dr. Bohan. It's such an exciting opportunity because this demonstrates collaboration with neuroscience. We not only collaborate on research, but we collaborate by having the same speaker in the same room at the same time, because this is also a neuroscience seminar. And so I'd like to, to turn over the introductions to my colleague from neuroscience, Dr. Norberto Grivitz, who's going to uh, continue to welcome you. Oh boy, this is really messy, you know, too many introductions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you um, Kwabena. Actually, I only today discover is called Kwabena. Having <laughs> a last name like mine and seeing my name mangled in so many ways, um, um, I'm happy I was mangling him too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, so, you know, um, neuroscientists that have tried to model the brain uh, have always find that because of the complexities of the neurons and the multitude of synaptic interactions um, and many other complex channel, ion channels, a uh, uh, you know, plethora of ion channels, modeling the brain is really hard. And uh, we know we do what we can. We model things in computers and try to get some amplifications. Um, then come along a group of scientists uh, that um, Dr. Boachem is um, a big expression of that actually come with the idea that it's actually possible to model some big chunks of the brain by building the models on chip um, and therefore bypass some of the limitations that we have um, in software. Um, and this is um, why we are so excited about the sort of work that is going to describe and why, of course, EE, you know, electrical engineering was so excited because it's really on, on, on the frontier between those two fields, um, and um, quite, it, it teaches quite a lot about how the brain can work. Um, anyway, so um, Dr. Boachen has been doing um, multi, you know, um, multi, mixed scale um, multi-chip computations, you know, in, um, combining analog and um, digital um, calculations in a variety of brain problems, um, particularly um, in sensory and perceptual systems. Um, it really has addressed lots of different modes, um, including auditory system, it has models of the cochlea, um, it has models of the retina and the visual system, models of the visual cortex, um, uh, also has developed um, some very exquisite models of synapses and plastic synapses, you know, how synapses actually change during learning. Um, and now, it's developed, the talk that he's going to give today um, it's even a more ambitious project where he's combining many of the things he has learned over the years um, called the NeuroGrid, where he's trying to build a simulation of, with a million neurons. Um, um, oh, you know, and, and, and capable then to model things like pieces of the cortex. Uh, just um, a short um, 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 few words about his path here. He, he took his PhD at Caltech um, about um, 10 years ago. Um, he then went to UPenn, University of Pennsylvania, where he spent, uh, um, he was a professor there for many years until last year, I think, right, when he moved to Stanford to a new department of bioengineering um, and where he's um, doing his work now. Uh, Dr. Wehen has many awards, actually, um, for, you know, even though he has relatively short career, he has been recognized by many uh, people. He has gotten uh, ONR, Young Investigator, uh, program Award, um, um, NSF Faculty um, Early Career Award, and more recently, the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, which is really a big deal. Um, and so his work has been um, well received and well recognized, and I talk too much, and I'll probably should let him speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Norberto. I'll use this one. So, with that glowing introduction, and uh, I would like to uh, dive right in here and tell you about this new project that we have called NeuroGrid. And our goal is to develop a system that can emulate a million neurons in the cortex. 
And my message in this talk will be that putting supercomputers on neuroscientists' desks that can simulate multiple cortical areas in real time is feasible in five years. I think we have the lights backwards. We probably want to kill these guys, and then we want to get the, the, the rest of the room. But we'll, maybe we can make that happen. OK, very nice. Very nice. And um, can you hear me? Am I OK on the mic? Yeah. And so, and so that's the, uh, the, the message I'm trying to convince you that uh, you should be looking forward to this in the next five years. And, but I'm going to start with some motivation, why I think that doing something like this is worth doing at this point in time. And the real motivation comes from all the wonderful work that people have been doing in experimental neuroscience, which has been generating data at an unprecedented rate, the ability to patch clump up in the dendrites and is revealing how the thousands of inputs that neurons receive are integrated. At the same time, electron microscope, uh, serial le scanning electron microscopes are revealing the microcircuitry in which these neurons are embedded. And two photon calcium imaging is mapping in vivo the responses of individual cells in the cortex, in the 3D volume of cortex. So all we need to do is to connect the dots. We have this, we reveal the integrative properties. We have to show how when they are embedded in the reconstructed microcircuitry, we can explain that behavior that we are mapping. Okay. I think we've got a wonderful opportunity here because we are going to have the information to do this. And we can also do this in collaboration with our experimental colleagues because they have to figure out when they can stop scanning and they can stop patching and so on and so forth. How are we going to know we are done? How can we know we have figured it out? We have to put it all back together and explain this, this, uh, this, the, this behavior. And so all we have to do is connect the dots, but it's not as easy as just connecting the dots, right? Uh, this is connect the dots from A to Z to draw a picture for you to see. Right? I wish it was that easy. Right? <laughs> We're not going to just take A, connect to B, and so on and so forth. Because we have a problem here which has a complexity that's much, much larger than that. Or in fact, any problem that we've attacked before. And the problem is one of scale. right? We have seven levels of investigation from the ion channels down here at the angstrom resolution up to the entire CNS at the meter resolution. That's 10 orders of magnitude in spatial scale. The three ways, basically, in which you can dissect such a complex system, right? The first approach is to the experimental one, and that's where these levels of investigation come from. There are people who just work on ion channels. There are people who work in vitro on characterizing individual neuron properties. There are people who are doing psychophysics up here on the entire system. And we don't link these levels together when we do experiments because we are not manipulating these variables at the different levels of the system. And so the, we, we, lost, we lose those, those links between the different levels. The second option is to analyze the system theoretically. And this is difficult because you have stochastic behavior, you have heterogeneity among the neurons, you have feedback recurring connections, and it's very nonlinear. And so theorists make these simplifying assumptions, and there's a lot of debate about what's the right assumption to make, and so on and so forth. And the third option is to simulate the system directly. Okay, this is an approach that we haven't really been able to pursue in a serious way, because you know these are very complex systems. But if we were able to do this, then we would be able to include all the details that's going to complement the theory. And we can control all the parameters that's going to complement the experiment. And so simulation becomes a third approach, which is complementary to these two approaches. And our goal is to be able to get that kind of computational power to allow us to do this in a serious way, and in a way that not just one group, but several groups can be pursuing this, make it that affordable to do this. And so just to illustrate that right now, this is very difficult to do, I'm going to walk you through what it's going to take to actually simulate a typical task that monkeys perform routinely in the laboratory. Say a spot comes up and the monkey has to reach for it. Uh, we've got a chunk of cortex here in, in V1, and we'd like to simulate what's going on there. 
based on all this information we have about the microcircuitry and the uh, neuronal properties. And so you take your 3D reconstruction of a cell and you divide it up into a bunch of compartments and you populate each of those compartments with the ion channel repertoire that that cell has that you've identified in vitro. And then you have to compute how much current flows into each, flows through each of those ion channel populations, which you do with a set of nonlinear differential equations up here. That's the Hodgkin Huxley model. And then you load all those equations for each compartment, for each cell, and for all the cells in your network onto the fastest computer that you can get your hands on. And this is the Blue Gene supercomputer. And there's actually a group in Stockholm that did this last year. Uh, Lasner's group, and they had one refrigerator-sized rack, which has 2,000 processors in it. That's three teraflop machine for a cool $2 million. And they were able to simulate 8 million neurons connected by 4 billion synapses. This number of neurons corresponds to about 9 degrees of visual field in V1, the primary visual cortex. So it's enough to see what's going on in maybe this much of the task. And so say the monkey does something, a one-second task, and you want to simulate what happens. That one second of activity took one hour and 20 minutes to simulate. And that's about 5,000 times slower than real time. So even though, though this machine does 10 to the 12 operations per second, it turns out that you need to do about 38 trillion operations. Just calculations, not machine instructions to, to, do, to do this, this one second of activity. And so the fastest machines we have right now are not up to the task. And as you guys all know, the machines are not getting any faster, right? So <laughs> we have to come up with a different way of doing this. And so the inspiration for the project I'm going to describe comes from physicists. And these astrophysicists have developed their own supercomputer. There's a group in the University of Tokyo, Jun Makino's group, has built this system that consists of 32 chips that they designed, 32 copies of the same chip. And they use these to simulate how galaxies collide. Okay, what they do is they replace each star with a point mass, and they calculate gravitational attraction between all the possible pairs of spikes of, of, of uh, planets, uh, stars. Sorry. And they can do this for a million stars. They can simulate entire galaxies. And the reason that's possible is that this board sits in a little thing that can sit right on your desk. And these chips are hardwired to compute the law of gravity. And that gives you, with this machine here, is a third as fast as a blue gene rack. So he was, in fact, the first guy to build a one teraflop machine. Okay? And with this machine here, at that, at that performance, they are selling these little things like at $40,000. And so that's 16 times more cost effective, more bang for the buck than with blue gene. And they've actually been done some interesting science with this. And so simulation really now has become a third branch of physics, a serious branch. And these guys are doing these numerical experiments. And they're coming up with, with, uh, with new phenomena that they, they can look for, uh, the experimenters can look for. And there's about three dozen labs now in the world that have these great supercomputers. And there were 40 papers published in 2000 alone. Uh, based on grape simulations. So grape sounds, sounds like gra gravity pipeline. So the question we ask ourselves is, can we build such a system for neuroscience and you know, make open the door to doing these kinds of simulations, not just in one group with $2 million, but you know, with a lot of different groups doing this? And so the system that we propose to build uh, NeuroGrid will consider, consist of one board with a grid of identical chips, just like you saw June Makino holding in the previous uh, slide. These are copies of the same chip, and each chip will be able to model a cell layer or a cell type in the cortex. And you'll be able to program the connectivity between these cells. And then within the chip itself, oh, see, okay, I'm, I wasn't expecting this, but <laughs> within, within the chip itself, and this is a little uh, uh, animation to show you how we do the programmable connections between the chips. And the idea is that you've got two chips here, and they have sitting on them these arrays of neurons, silicon neurons, that I'll show you how we built those. And we would like a spike from this chip to end up with this synapse. 
and aspire from that neuron to end up with that, uh, that synapse. And the way we do that is we assign addresses to all the individual neurons, and we assign addresses to all the individual synapses. And when this neuron spikes, address 0 comes off the chip, and when that one spikes, address 3 comes off the chip. And we can use those addresses to look up another address from a memory, a memory chip. And then it's that address that we send to the next chip. And so when we see address 0, we look up 1, and we send that to this chip, and that activates this synapse. And you can see now that just by changing the addresses that you store in here, you can change how these guys connect. And so how, that's how we program the connections this is a digital approach, whereas the neurons themselves are modeled in an analog fashion, which is something that's new that's going to make this much more powerful than the grape system. And so those, these chips are the things that are arrayed in a grid. And those chips we call neural cores. They have these silicon neuron arrays on them. And then there we have ion channel properties that we can program as well so that these can be different types of cells than those guys. And we can also have multiple compartments per neuron. And I'll point out a little bit later why that's useful. And so in two years, we are, our goal is to develop a million neuron system consisting of a 4 by 4 grid of chips with 256 by 256 neurons. And if you do the math, it turns out that this corresponds to a 300 teraflop machine. A, a grape is one teraflop. And uh, that is something like 100 refriger refrigerator-sized blue gene racks for a cool $200 million. And we think that this system will be comparable in cost to the grape system. It's a similar level of complexity, similar number of chips, and so on. And so the breakthrough that we are trying to capitalize on is an approach that's different from simulating, something we call emulating. Okay, we want to get rid of these equations and look at the, we are trying to basically figure out these ion channels that are sitting in the membrane of a cell in a compartment have uh, passing a setting amount of current, and that's what we compute with all these equations. But instead of doing that, we can actually emulate the flow of ions directly with the flow of electrons across the transistor. We just have to figure out how to change this voltage such that that current changes in the same way that these ion channels open and close as we change the voltage. And so this exploits the physical analogy between the flow of electrons and the flow of ions. That actually captures the noise or the stochastic behavior as well. And this approach is called analog VLSI, and it was pioneered by Kavamid in the late 80s. And this is the best part about this approach is that it runs in real time. One second of activity will take one second to simulate, not an hour and 20 minutes in this system. So the, I'm going to get you a little bit into, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to get into, let me turn it off. I'm going to get into a little bit of the background about the history of building these analog VLSI systems. And then I'm going to go into the different technologies that we've developed in addition to the analog VLSI approach that would allow us to program these connections and to scale it up so we have multiple chips in the system. And in the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the abstraction that we are using, how we are actually going to map this onto a cortex or map a cortical model onto this system. And then at the end, maybe some kinds of scientific questions that we could go after with this approach. Although I'm interested in doing that myself, I think other people out there who use the system will actually have other interesting ideas that they could actually check out. So that's just a minor part of, of what we are doing. The real thing is to really try to get a system like this out there for people to use. <laughs> and so the um, original uh, analog VLSI system that Kavami tried to develop was a silicon retina, a model of the retina. And that system has evolved to this point where we now have a five-layer model of the retina developed by Kareem Zago, my first PhD student. That captures the responses of the four types of ganglion cells that constitute 90% of the optic nerve. And these, guys, these two guys here that we are going to color code in red and green respond in a sustained fashion to either dark brightness or darkness, on or off. 
And then there's counterparts of those who respond in a transient fashion to brightness or darkness. And so what you're going to see here is Kareem standing in front and waving his head back and forth in front of the chip. And the chip is then putting out these ganglion cells. It's got like an optic nerve with spikes coming off of it. And we are going to make pictures out of those spikes just by painting pixels red if it's this type of cell off sustain. That means dark contrast. Or green if it's that type of cell on sustain, which means white background. And then when he's actually moving, you're going to see responses from these yellow and blue cells, which are transient. They only respond when it, he moves. It's getting darker here, it's getting brighter here. And so you see that come up here in this picture here. The, and up here is a reconstruction of the scene based on those spikes. Okay? So this is a decoded image. And it should, it should, it should pop up right here. And so you see the activity here is very sparse, as you expect from all the filtering that happens in the retina. But yet, you can see, barely recognize, it's only 50 by 30 uh, pixels up here in this image. You can barely recognize uh, Kareem up there. And this chip dissipates 60 milliwatts. And so over the years, these are the kinds of things that people have used this analog DLSI approach to do, where they are able to buy, and let me just show you one data slide, because that's just a movie. But you can see, actually, when you repeat the same kind of physiological experiments that people do in the cat, with the chip, this particular case, you're changing the contrast of a counterface grading. It's going black, white, black, white. Um, and you repeat that with the chip. You can get the same you know, compressive growth of the, of the response with contrast, as well as the faster, the speed up in the response at higher contrast. And so those contrast gain control is just one of the four things we, we matched in the, in the retina. And so the way they approach that was taken to do these kinds of uh, chips is to actually look at the synaptic organization of the retina, so the different cell types and how they interact. This one inhibits that one. And we replace that synapse with a transistor that connects this node, which represents that cell's voltage. And the voltage here represents that node's, that cell's voltage. And there's a current that the transistor makes that emulates the current that's going to be flowing through the ion channels that are gated by this synaptic input. Okay. And if you connect the transistor that way, you can model inhibition. By doing it this way, you can model excitation. And by doing it that way, you can model gap junctions or conduction between cells. And so you give me a circuit diagram of the retina with these inhibition excitatory gap junction coupling. And we can map that onto a, a chip, into a silicon chip. And that's how the retina, you, you just, the, 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 the output of that retina was generated. And the thing that we do here is that we operate transistors down here in this region, which is called the subthreshold region, where they pass picoamps or tens of picoamps or fractions of a nanoamp of current. Okay, and that region here, these are the kinds of currents that you get inside a cell, right? To make it fire, you have to pump in about a nanoamp or 100 picoamps or something. You know, when you have a population of ion channels 10 on or off, those are kinds of stuff. So we match those current levels, and we use and then and then we get this kind of behavior. And so what hadn't happened, what people hadn't been able to do actually, is to actually capture the actual ion channel behavior in terms of the active properties. Okay, so these are just synapses, but within a cell itself, you've got ion channels that are sensitive to the cell's own voltage. And as that voltage changes, more of them open or close. And this is actually how cells generate spikes or burst, or oscillate, you know, with small substantial oscillations and things like that. And, and so this is a recently something that we figured out how to do in analog VLSI by looking very closely at how a transistor works and comparing that, this is a transistor, with how an ion channel actually works. So you can write down, you can draw an energy diagram for the ion channel when it's trying to transition from the closed state to the open state. If it needs a certain amount of energy, to overcome this barrier, and then it just drops down into that open configuration. And it can go the other way. If it gets enough energy, it can flip back into this state. And similar to a transistor, you have the same kind of thing. There's electrons sitting here at the source, and they need a certain amount of energy to get into the channel, then they just sucked it, get sucked out into the drain. They can also flow backwards if they have enough energy to come back. 
And this diagram has the same form of, as that. And it's not just a qualitative match, right? It's a quantitative match because actually these gating particles, you know, the uh, channel opening and closing, and these electrons jumping up and down from the drain to the source, do that at an exponential rate as we lower the barrier. So as we change the voltage, the membrane voltage so this barrier becomes smaller, we get more and more transistors jumping, I mean electrons jumping that barrier if we do it with the gate of the transistor. And similarly, if we do it with the membrane voltage of the cell, we get more and more ion channels opening. And both of those things are exponential. And so it's actually a qu quantitative match between these two behaviors. And so by doing this, by, by just pushing this analogy through, we were able to model with just three, tra three transistors this type of nonlinear dynamics that was before described by this set of five equations in the hodgkin huxley model or formulation. And we just have, all we have to do is to modulate the gate voltage of the transistor the same way that the membrane voltage modulates this barrier height that the ion channels have to overcome to open. And so this is just to show you some results of that. This is here is going to show you the physiological measurements that uh, physiologists make where they do voltage clamp experiments where they step the voltage of the cell and hold it at different levels. And they measure how much current flows through that particular type of ion channel that they've isolated. And you've got a final level that it reaches and then you've got a uh, certain amount of time it takes to get there. And so that final level, that's called the steady state level, you plot that against the membrane voltage, you get a sigmoid. And this is true for a whole bunch of different ion channels. And when you plot how fast or how long it takes to get to steady state, you get a bell-shaped curve. So it's slow at intermediate voltage levels, but it's fast. It reaches steady state very quickly on either side. We can get the same thing to happen with this circuit here, consisting of three, set, three transistors. We repeat the same voltage clamp experiments. We can get these current, uh, current uh, waveforms. And then we extract the time constant and steady state the same way physiologists do, and we get a, bell, bell, uh, a sigmoid for the steady state level and a bell curve for the, um, for the time constant. And so this is the first time we've been able to do this or anybody else has been able to do this in silicon. And further all, we can actually program these sigmoids and bell curves by changing the voltage we put here. We can shift the voltage at which the channel activates, the point at which half the channels will be open. And we go to shift the time constant. We can make things slower and faster. And we can also model what's called inactivation. So by making this voltage small and that voltage high instead of the reverse, we can actually make a ch uh, uh, design a channel that closes when the voltage increases. That's called inactivation. And there are some channels that have both activation and inactivation. So with two of these circuits, we can model both processes within the same channel. And so this breakthrough here, let me just step back for a second. This breakthrough here is really going to allow us in a very efficient way to be able to model the dynamics of neurons and these nonlinear properties and the way that biologists think is actually important to describe how they behave. And furthermore, just a second, furthermore, it's a general framework. So this hodgkin actually model is used to describe all different kinds of channels. And so it's got the same generality as that model does. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's a good good question here. These these guys are much more noisy here than the currents here. Now I said earlier that when you use electrons to emulate the flow of ions, it's this stochasticity. You get the same kind of stochasticity, and the noise levels that you get in cells depend on how many ion channels are opening and closing because they flicker open and close randomly. And the noise levels we get in transistors depend on how many electrons are flowing. And so at lower current levels, we'll get much more noisy traces here. At higher current levels, we get less noisy, tr noisy traces. So just by setting the current levels which you operate with, you can change the amount of noise that you operate with. So you can try to match that, that as well. Yeah, it's a question. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's a good, a good, a good, a good question. Yeah. So, so the voltage scale is different here than it is over there, and so the actual process we use this to model a T-type calcium current. And the way we did that was that you know we looked at the the sigmoid we were trying to to match, 
and then we look at the sigmoid that we got out of a, 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 a transistor. And we took this voltage range and we said, okay, now we are going to map this voltage range into that voltage range, right? So there's a setting factor. So when it changes by 100 millivolts here, it changes by 300 millivolts here. And so we just rescale things, okay? So there are some power yes, there's some power implications, but it comes from the fact that, you know, actual ion channels have more than one gating particle. And so a lot of gates have to open before then the, the thing is open. And this then means you are moving four charges across the membrane instead of just one. And those kinds of things factor into this voltage scale here. Okay, so, so that's something. Whereas we only have one. Uh, okay. So, but this is the, 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 the main core of the neurogrid idea, where it's based on this that we have the flexibility that we need to be able to actually use this as a way of modeling different kinds of cells. And the other part of the neurogrid architecture is be able to take several of these chips, all with the same neurons, with the same ion channel models on them, the same ion channel circuit, but then to be able to then apply those two voltages I mentioned differently on the different ones so that they are modeling different types of cells, right? And so you'd like to have several copies of this chip working together, and that means that you'd have to be able to send spikes to several chips and, and have spikes back from several different chips. And so we... We did this, built this system here just as a way of exploring or developing the technology to do that. And this is called a grid because their cells just talk to their neighbors. Okay, and this is a four chip example. And it's actually the biggest, largest system that has been built to, get to date. You know, it has about 35,000 uh, spiking neurons in it, plus cream, silicon, retina that's driving everything. And this system here is based on this idea that. Um, Spikes are relayed from cell to cell with these what I call splits, and then spikes are all the outputs are also collected from from chip to chip with this these measures here. And so the system that that was we were modeling with that with that actual prototype that you saw there was this orientation selectivity in in the cortex in primary visual cortex. And as you know, the cortex is laid out in this, one of the ways of describing it, this ice cube model, where you think of these hypercolumns, where you've got cells with the same property, where the, they all like the same orientation in each column. And as you move in the two dimensions, you have different orientations, inputs from different eyes, and then different locations of visual space. Okay. So those are the feature maps that you find in cortex. And we built a system, in the 1D grid that we built, we wanted to use four different chips copies of the same chip identically, but we tune them differently so that this chip here is now the vertical orientation. That's horizontal, that's 45 degrees, and so on. Okay. So we basically have split the cortex apart. You know, these normally these guys which are processing the same part of visual space are sitting next to each other in the cortex, but now they are sitting on different chips. But then we wanted to put that back by sending spikes among those different guys which belong to the same hypercolumn so they can interact in the same way that they would in cortex. Okay, so we wouldn't actually, in neurogrid, we're not gonna map it this way, but we're gonna use the same architecture, the way in which the chips will talk to each other in order, in order to make these connections between uh, different, different cells. And so that was this, this is just a demonstration that we can do that. We can split the computation across several chips and we can then put in the, the right connectivity to do that. And so here you're gonna see some more details about this system. So the system looks like that. On each board here is the chip that we designed, which we call the Gabor chip because it models the orientation tuning, receptive field. And so we actually designed this little piece of silicon here, blown up here. It's got an array of 32 by 64 neurons on it, and actually 32 by 64 times four. At each point, there's four neurons that represent the four combinations of even and odd space phase and on and off contrast, okay? So you can have an even on or even off and odd on and odd off responses. So just to summarize very briefly, this is the kind of, these are the kinds of interactions that Judith works on figuring out how all these interactions are okay and you build up these kinds of selective responses, Judith Hesh. And so that's what we are modeling here, but in a more abstract way, not in a very detailed way like we plan to do in neurogrid. And so this system here then, if there's one of those arrays of neurons on each of these boards here, 
and we tune them by applying different voltages to them to get a, an even receptor field that's tuned is vertically likes vertical orientation or an odd receptor field that likes vertical we go to 45 0 and minus 45 degrees and so the retinal input goes to all these these cells and they produce these kinds of responses based on the receptor fields and then we can actually send this guy's output to inhibit this guy or to inhibit that guy by feeding the 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 the, the, the outputs back into the input and that's the number of neurons you have on this chip, and that's how much power it dissipates. And so with this system, we we're actually able to develop a way of having several chips involved in the same network or in the same, uh, model the same cortical area. And this is my movie animation I showed you earlier. Uh, this part now is now we want to be able to program connectivity. So in the system I showed you before, it's only within a column. So we have this way of sending a spike to any other neuron at the corresponding location on the different chips, right? And so, and then we can also make it inhibit the other guys as well. But to get a full flexibility, we would like to, you know, with the scheme that I showed you where each neuron has an address and each synapse has an address, and we can remap, translate one address into a different address so we can then implement the connection from here to there. We've now been able to include this memory chip directly on the chip so that it's an on-chip RAM memory is stored in here. So as spikes are going around from chip to chip, they come into this chip and you look up in the memory and you say, oh, this guy, I'm not going to connect him, and you filter that spike. Or you say, this guy is actually going to go in as an inhibitory input to this particular cell. So you can actually reprogram this RAM here to implement whatever interaction you want between the cells. Yeah. Yes, so that's in this neural grid system, but we've actually built, this is actually the, why we did this. We wanted to model, you see these things actually uh, drawn to look like growth cones. They have little filopodia. So in the system that we developed this, this system here actually, but with an off-chip RAM, to actually see these on the chip, we might want to move this connection from here to here, and that's computed by sensing gradients within this chip. And we can send this link which identifies these two cells out here and swap those two guys in memory so that now this spike ends up here rather than that. Okay, so that, the, so the, we go up these ways of modern plasticity, anatomical plasticity and so on. But the, the, that would be NeuroGrid version 2.0 or something before you get that. <laughs> okay, but, but earlier on we just want to have the user specify the connectivity and explore different network architectures or ideas about how different cortical areas are interacting and different layers are interacting. And so just to point out, um, you know, this summarizes the three different technologies really that go into making this system work. There's the analog VLSI to give us the ion channel properties, okay? Then there's the digital VLSI to be able to, oh sorry, there's the digital VLSI like you're seeing here to be able to program connectivity, connectivity just by changing what you store in these uh, memory, in the memory, in the memory. And there's the grid network to be able to take this chip and re replicate it, several copies of that chip, and have them all be able to con interconnect with each other. Okay, those are the three things that go into, into building this neural grid system. When we demonstrated all these, we have them working, working chips that do this stuff. And so the uh, way in which we're gonna put this together to build neural grid is illustrated here with this slide. It's it's a little bit complicated. I'll try and walk you through, through uh, uh, slowly. And so, the idea is that on each chip you're going to have an array of these neurons sitting there. They're just a bunch of these ion channel circuits that you can then define which way you want after after the chip is fabricated or for that particular copy of the chip. And that these cells on this chip are supposed to represent a layer of cells in the cortex or a particular cell type. And then the different layers of cortex are mobbed onto different chips, copies of the same chip. And then we have this way you saw in a 1D gray. We have this way of collecting all the outputs and distributing the input to all the, ch all the chips. And then we also have an on-chip RAM here, which allows us to implement interactions within a column. So that's a columnar microcircuit or a canonical microcircuit, they call it. 
And those interactions within a column, they are called canonical because they're the same for every column. Okay? And so that's stored in this each chip. Okay, how it connects to the other chips. That's all you have to specify because the where where you are on the chip, you make the same connections between corresponding locations. And so that's your columnar microcircuit. And then if you wanted to make a long range connection from one hypercolumn to another hypercolumn, that's this purple wire here, you can store that in this off chip RAM, where you can translate from XY location on this chip to a different XY location on that chip. You just store those pairs of addresses on, on, on here. And then finally, we have this grid here, or this mesh in brown here, which allows us to implement an arbor. So when that spike comes into this location, it activates, it stimulates not just the neurons at that location, but it stimulates neighboring neurons with some profile that simulates the arbor of that axon. Okay. And so with these three connection fabrics, we can implement a very high degree of connectivity in the system. In particular, you know, with the on-chip RAM, we can send a spike. You know, when we send a spike in, it's going to hit six different guys if it goes to six different chips. And then with the off-chip RAM, we can take one spike and we can translate it into 10 different addresses and send them in. And then with this arbor here, where we go in and we hit guys in a stereotype fashion that decays with distance, we can hit maybe up to a 10 by 10 neighborhood. And so that allows us to actually one spike to influence up to 6,000 different cells, or one input to get inputs, one cell to get inputs from up to 6,000. So this is comparable to the kind of degree of uh, connectivity you have in the in the in the cortex. And so, if you had a million a million neurons, you can get over a billion connections in the, in this with this approach. And then I'll say a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying that that's like a um, that's like a arbor. So when I go into a particular location in cortex, and I want to connect to this orientation, this column that is in that orientation, I can connect to that with a full strength. Let's normalize it to one, and then decaying with an exponential weight, I connect to neighboring hypercolumns because they have similar orientations, and so you can set the space constant for this. Uh, waiting, but you know it's stereotyped. You you can't yeah you just get on, so. so the idea is 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 that when a, a, a an axon grows into a particular region in cortex, it makes most of its connections locally, but there's a profile that 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 that's involved. You have these patchy connections, yeah. Okay. And so and so that's a little bit about how we can actually get a billion connections uh, with, between these million neurons. And the way in which we, we are going to actually use these ion channels circuits to model the electrophysiological properties of the neurons is we like this two compartment abstraction of a pyramidal cell, which we think is the simplest one that is still interesting enough to actually combine different inputs from different layers of cortex. So as you know, the different layers in cortex are actually the targets or the uh, origin of projections that go between cortical areas. And so you have these forward, backward, and lateral projections. The way I think about it is each cortical area has three different outputs and three different inputs. It's like feeding forward, it's getting feedback, and it's interacting within that layer. And these, th these different inputs come into different layers. And then it also has to produce uh, corresponding outputs. And, and so the thing that links to get that the activity between these layers is this pyramidal cells structure where it can have a dendritic tuft up here, the apical dendrites in one layer, and it can have its basal dendrites down here in a different layer. And then there's an interaction that occurs between inputs here and inputs down there, which is captured by this two compartment model developed by Lucia et al. And in particular, the gain, the sensitivity to inputs coming in on the basal dendrite can be changed by the inputs coming in on the apical dendrite. And that's captured here by the slope here, changing the slope of this curve. And this is interesting because the feedback projections from higher levels target these superficial layers of the cortex. And so this is the minimal model that can capture the interaction that's happening between these different feedback and feedforward projections. And so they are, this is our favorite right now for trying to hook up these ion channel models to model that kind of process. 
And in addition, this in order to in, in, in addition to capturing this nonlinear interaction here, the two compartment model, as uh, Sejnaus's group showed about ten years ago, it just with the same ion channel properties, just changing the coupling between the two compartments, can change the firing pattern. So these are the firing patterns of different cells, different types, types of cortical cells, and they're able to reproduce that in the in the in the model here without changing anything else, just changing the coupling between the basal and the Edgar compartment. And so that's the basic uh, architecture and the basic abstractions that NeuroGrid is based on. Yeah, over here. Right. But the, everything, everything is silicon. So the idea is that this is a model, just like you can do in software, you can build a model. You can also implement the model in this system. But we are not interfacing with, with wet stuff. Is that the question you're asking? You're putting up a oh, I see. I'm just making the analogy. Let me go back. Yeah, so I'm saying this is my cartoon. This is my cartoon of, my word where here is my cartoon of what Cortex looks like. And this is my my architect, right? Yeah. So I'm trying to map this circuit, cortical circuit, onto this hardware. Yeah. Yeah. How about the range connection? Even the same way that about the same orientation. Yeah. 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 So this connection here, you know, this 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 is a column, and that's another column. This is a connection from one column to the other. And you're asking a question about how far apart can these two columns be in the system? And there's no real constraint on that because this this you go through you go into the RAM and you can map this address onto any other address that you want. So it can be the full extent. Right. No, that's just how far it affects things in the in the point that you target. So the center of the elbow can be anywhere, and then the the extent of the elbow is something that then you you specify separately. Yeah. Okay, and that could be based on different cell types. You know, project more diffuse or more focus. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. They are conductance based. Conductance based. Synapses. I haven't said anything about that because we've already, you know, that's pretty standard. People have been doing that for a while. But we can model synapses, we can model them as conductances, and we can model the time course of the EPSP or the IPSC. So there's a rise time, there's a decay constant, and those can be can be specified. Yeah. Okay, so you can not only target, you know, the basal or the ape cow dendrites, you can see this is an NMDA input with a slow time course, or this is an ampere input that's fast, and so on. OK, so just a very brief word. We're, we're at, uh, we've got a few minutes left. Just a brief word on the kinds of thing I think will be possible to do with this system, and in particular, what my personal interest is. And, and so we all know that back here in the brain is the visual cortex that takes up a huge part of that, that uh, occipital lo lobe there. And within the visual cortex alone, there's something like 30 different areas. Uh, two that have been very well studied, uh, these areas between V1 and MT. And there's projections that come back from MT to V1. And those 30 different areas, about half the connections among those areas are feedback connections. 
yet we have a view of MT or the way in which motion occurs is computed that's purely feed forward. We think of V1 as identify the motion of edges and then MT putting that information together to get the motion of objects. And yet we have all these feed out projections and they are rampant all over among these different areas. And so we haven't really been able to address this and we've ignored these kinds of questions. And I think that if you're able to build these models that include more than one cortical area and also have the different layers, which are the recipients or the origin for those area-to-area -area projections, we can actually start to put together some kinds of, test some of these hypotheses that are out there about what's going on with the feedback and actually make the kinds of predictions or get the type of readout from these models that you can actually compare with actual, what you can actually record when you do an experiment. And one of the hypotheses that are particularly interesting is that somehow when you split this visual world into 30 different representations, somehow you have to put that all back together because when we look out there, we see one coherent percept. We are not seeing 30 different things. And so somehow the feedback and the interactions between these cortical areas is generating a coherent uh, percept of, of what's going on. And so that's something that I think that you could actually look at with this system. And my strategy would be to do it for just two areas. And since the structure of cortex is, is quite regular and you have these different six layers and these connections, feedback, feed forward projections tend to terminate in a stereotype way. We, can, we hope that, that what we learn from that system would then help us understand what's happening among larger numbers of uh, cortical areas. And so I'm just going to summarize uh, briefly that we've got these three technologies that we demonstrated. The first is the grid network. Uh, the second is the digital VLSI with the on-chip SRAM that allows us to program connections. And the third is the analog VLSI for the ion channel models, which we can tune to model different types of ion channels. And with these technologies in hand, in five years, I believe we'll be able to build this neural grid system, which will give you supercomputer type power on your desktop. How much money? I think about 60K, maybe. So <laughs> comparable to what, what the uh, grape system costs, because it's a similar type of, type of design. And I would just like to put the slide up with my acknowledgments. And uh, if you want to learn more about what we've done, all those different chips we built that I didn't talk about, you can look at the May issue of uh, May 2005 issue of Scientific American. And thank you very much for your attention. few questions. Um, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, I think you partially answered it in the conversations that we've had in the past, but uh, the question is how are you overcoming the problems of scale yeah. in building up larger systems? So you have a small system, you're doing a mini column. Yeah. Uh, how are you going to scale all that up to a larger portion? Right. So I think the mesh or the grid network is critical for this. And I think that with the grid network, we have what I call an expandable system. As you add more chips to the system, it doesn't slow down the, the, the number of spikes, reduce the number of spikes you can transmit. Because you know each link is short, and the traffic going back and forth between these chips can go just as fast, because you, know, you don't affect what's going on between these chips, two chips by adding that. Whereas the way in which what you have in your PC is this PCI bus, Every card that you add onto your PC uses the same bus. And then, you know, it basically you get this bottleneck and you can't expand the system. So that's a key part of it. And then the second part of it is just our ability. We've, we've been able to, by building all these individual systems, we've come up with these blocks that are robust, that work, that work well, that we have confidence that when we build a 512 by 512 array, it's going to work great and uh, we're not going to run into this one. So we've done a lot of debugging of the circuits and all this asynchronous digital stuff that makes things communicate when a spike happens, it sends it out, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, it just you just have to build it and see what happens. So your system, <laughs> your system's scaling. It's yeah, scale yeah, 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 yeah. Scalable, which is the key word here. Uh, 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 questions? So people have been making models Yes. And 
Yeah. I'm one of them. <laughs> for example, for the orientation selectivity, yeah. describe several people have proposed different versions of the selectivity to achieve some try to explain data, some typological data. Yeah. And they do they are successful to some degree, as you know. Ken Miller, for example, has a model for orientation. Yes. Like Chaplin has a model yeah. and so on and so forth. What are, uh, what are the features of what you think would emerge from this kind of simulations that are not seen in this model? They, they seem to That's be a good question. That's a good question, yeah. I think that the the most interesting physiological results that I've seen so far that pertain to this question are from uh, Bond, Rick Bond's group at MGH, and he has actually looked at trying to record from cells in V1 and from cells in MT, for example, or V4, and also to look at the motor output. Okay, so you put out something that's moving in a certain direction and monkeys have to move their eyes and track that object. And we know that very low down in V1, the receptor fields are so small that if they're only looking at the edge, they can't really tell whether it's going like this or it's just going like this, right? And so the only thing they can tell is that it's going this way, you know, but they can't really tell the component that's perpendicular to the edge. And this is called the aperture problem. And so there's this mystery about how, you know, even though you don't have all the information, you can track the thing accurately. And actually, when you look at the responses in V1, there are these things called end-stop cells. And people have said, okay, if you have an end-stop cell, it's only going to respond there. And it can, at the edge, you can see which way it's going. Okay, so the end-stop cells have the right information. And people have thought about this in a feed-forward way. It's a special kind of cell that makes this end-stopping and it does this. But what Rick's results seem to suggest is that feedback from MT is coming in and it's actually because the evolution of the right responses in MT matches the evolution of end stopping and these kinds of things in V1. And so there's some interaction that, you know, people have explained all this stuff in terms of feed for it because we don't really, it's very difficult to do these experiments where you're looking at these different areas continuously. And you're tracking the motion so you know what the perception is, you know, the eye movement, what the monkey's uh, perception is. And so, these are the kinds of things that will come out. It's really like what I said, there are 30 areas. You've broken up the image into all these parts. At the level of receptive field, you're doing the same thing. You're broken it up into all these little pieces of information. Somehow you have to put them back together. And the people think this happens in a purely feed-forward way, but we know that feedback dominates. Even in the LGN, 90, you know, 10 to 1 ratio of guys coming back into the LGN. So. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, 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 no. So the way the thing works, I'll take the second one first. The way the grape thing was developed is that June Makino's lab makes these chips. And there's a small outfit that's a uh, nonprofit or just a small uh, startup company that actually puts them, builds the boards and sells the systems and deal with all the cost customer support. Okay. And so they concentrate on building the next. They're up to grade six now. You know, they're building grade seven, grade eight, while these guys deal with you know, making the system available. I'm not interested in starting a company. I'm hoping one of my students or somebody would do this. But yeah, so the idea is there's going to be some other outfit that does this and deals with it because I want to go on to you know, grade 3.0 and stuff, you know? <laughs> and, so, and so that's the thing. And so in terms of the first question, how do I think of programming, how you, you deal with the programming? You know, I myself, I'm very interested in the kinds of results that people are, you know, working out the secretary like Judith Hirsch does, does these kinds of experiments. She's looking at how these on and off inputs are combined to generate these receptor fields. And so if you tell me that in layer four, this is how things are wired, then that's how I'm going to base my connectivity in my column or my interactions between the different cell types on those on those kinds of connection patterns. And then people have also mapped, you know, you don't have to actually do it at an EM level where you reconstruct tissue. You can actually use a technique called laser scanning for the stimulation. So 
once you, you know, in vivo, you can generate these feature orientation maps. And then you can take the tissue, you can slice it up in a dish, and you can record while you uncage glutamate at different positions. That's with the laser. And so then you can see which how the cell you're recording from, whether it's getting inhibition or excitation from which columns it's getting inputs from. And you can then, because you did the, the orientation map while you were in vivo, right, you can register that connectivity with the map. So you can see, you can, they can give me wiring diagrams as to if this column has this orientation and this hypercolumn, and that column has that orientation and that other hypercolumn, how do they interact? And so I can base my horizontal connections on this. Right. And so that's the idea, to take this information that's out there and use that to specify the connectivity and see whether we can link the layers together. Right. <laughs> yes. No, that's what I'm saying. So we do it in a hierarchical way, right? That's this, the beauty of this ABO, right? So we can get thousands of inputs but we are not connecting each one individually. You can do it with this system. You can say your ABO size is zero, right? And then you have to put in all these connections individually. Okay, it's less efficient to do it that way because you have to send all these spikes into the chip. Whereas if a spike gets in and it's going to talk to this guy, but it also wants to talk to this guy, wants to talk to that guy, you don't have to send all these other spikes to those guys. And this is the way Cortex is organized, right? When you go and make a connection in a setting area, you make an ABO and you connect locally within that area. So that's hardwired into the chip in the sense that there's this way of spreading the information. You make an EPSP here that's this big, you make one here that's that big, you make one there that's that big, right? And you can decide how fast you want it, how far you want it to spread. And so that takes care of a factor of 100, just one spike can hit 100 guys, and then you tend 10 spikes to 10 different places, that's 1,000 guys. And then you can keep going with different chips and so on. So that's the, it's, it's designed in the same way that Cortex is wired. Yeah. Did you have a question? First off. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so, <laughs> so that's my, you know, that's my, one of my motives for doing this. I think it's very hard. I think it's very hard to build a system that actually does vision in the, in the way that our brain does it. And I think that we could build something right now, but I think ideas are wrong. We've got these misconceptions. misconceptions. And so I'm trying to use the technology that we have to make a tool where we can actually go after this question, that we can actually figure out really how the brain does it, and then we can come back and build something that will really blow somebody away. Yeah. <laughs> For what? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the best I can say at this point, uh, what I said about the 30 different cortical areas, I, I really think that's interesting. I think that you're going to have cells over here that are doing stereo. You're going to have cells over here that are doing motion. You're going to have cells that are high up in, in this hierarchy and so on. And I don't think that it happens in such a way that any area has the right answer. They have to negotiate among themselves and come up, you know, this is a computer scientist will say you have to solve the problem in a compositional fashion, right? So the answer pops out correctly in every area simultaneously, right? And that's happening, you know, with this, this massive interaction back and forth going on simultaneously. And people who are doing computer vision have reached a point where they, they can do edges very well. They can do motion, they can do all this stuff. But they realize that to get the few errors they are getting in this, if they had, were able to do the other thing, will help them and so on and so forth. And so they really, for them to make progress, they really have to have these things talk to each other and do that. And Cortex has figured out how to do it. And it's very hard because you have feedback, the thing will go unstable. You don't know how, you know, it's, you know, things will get wedged, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm humble. Yeah, you know, I'm being humbled by trying to do this. And I realize I really need to learn a lot more scientifically about what's going on. It's not Okay, yeah. I'm saying that we don't burn a new circuit. We can, we can change the wiring without actually changing the actual metal wires on the chip because we do this in a virtual way. So there's an address that you can send in just like how... Yes, yeah. 
So the channel properties, again, because we, we can change them by changing the voltages that we apply in this hydrogen acting model that we, we, we developed. Yeah, so, but that, that voltage can be controlled by D to A that's getting input from the computer. So, so we do this already, yeah. And so it looks like software. You just type whatever you want and it, and, and it, and it does it, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, that's great. Version you know, grid 10.0. <laughs> and so and so the uh the, the 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 we've done that's how I became interested in development. And we build a couple of models of both activity dependent and activity independent development. Because I think that really that's a fundamental way to answer this question. So you know, the system is very complicated, but there must be some rules that define that organization. And this happens during the course of development. And eventually, we'd like to put this kind of plasticity, which we've explored in these chips, in neural grids, so that you have both an atomical and synaptic plasticity, and make these rules take care of programming the system. Then it becomes a real technology that can do something. But, um, but you know, that not in this version. This initial version is just to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. No, I think that a basic, yeah, yeah, I think that if you can demonstrate a system where you don't just have one, I'll use modality, but supposing I could be doing stereo and I could be doing motion at the same time, and I could have the parallax I'm picking up in the motion influence the stereo solution, and the stereo solution influence the motion solution so that they are consistent. And it, this is envisioned as a feedback going to different in the superficial areas and modulating how this guy responds. So that they can, they can, they, so because I think if you can solve this sort of composition of the two operations in one instance, just the pairwise way, and do it in such a way that it generalizes, then you can, you can really get to the 30 different areas, right? So that's a problem I'd like to go after is, 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 is demonstrate that. That stereo alone doesn't get the answer, motion alone doesn't get the answer, and the two together get the answer. Well, I, I know we'd love to debate this a while longer because this is a fascinating subject and one yeah. that some of us are spending a lot of time on. Uh, but we do have a reception, yeah. and uh, they have a schedule in neuroscience to keep today. So at this point, I'd like to close. And again, thank, uh, thank Kwabana for just a wonderful seminar. Where is it? Where is it? It's right outside.